making sure everything is up and running. Hello, hello and salam, peace lovers and peacemakers. Welcome to Peace Mindedly. Here in the US is a special week for us. It's the Thanksgiving week and we are excited and we are so proud of this festivity. Although I know that we are in pandemic, but at least a few places has re removed the lockdown and some, I mean, some of the families and friends can get together. So therefore, we we are excited for this week particularly especially after you know last week that everything was in so much limbo so at least we can get together and celebrate thanksgiving uh, thanksgiving is a special day for me uh, for a few reasons so when, when when about 22 years ago i entered the united states was november 17 about one week away from thanksgiving and I, I never forget, so <laughs> I'm going to explain you what happened. Uh, I was uh, joining my fiancé, uh, soon-to-be uh, husband, and then with my um, uh, to-be father-in-law, that later became, became my father-in-law, we were invited to one of my friend's house. So the friend was uh, my brother-in-law's very, very close friend. So they were established family. Iranian family and then uh, the the lady of the house had a table it was the first time ever I mean of course we do have turkey in Iran I mean I've seen turkey but I have never eaten turkey ever it was my first time so then uh, we are in around and they were a family of five people and then they only had us because they they didn't want to um, make me so scared of too many people around so anyway they had us in their household and we had a beautiful gigantic table and for the first time ever I ate turkey. Everyone warned me that you need to be careful about eating turkey because after afterwards you may feel bloated. And exactly that's what happened. I felt so bloated. I couldn't do anything. So I asked, um, said that, please, can we walk around the neighborhood so then I can I can just feel a bit more relaxed before going to bed. It was it was fascinating experience. And then really brought me to this question of what is Thanksgiving? Why we eat turkey in Thanksgiving? And and what are the, all the traditions attached to Thanksgiving? Before I go to my guest, that is fabulous, fabulous in explaining food and everything. I would like to uh, play um, a short clip. It's about three minutes uh, clip uh, from Britannica. Um, Yes, strangely and oddly enough, British are explaining what is Thanksgiving to us Americans, but I found it very, um, very informative. So I'm going to play that uh, clip and then we're going to come back with our beautiful, amazing guest, Omid Rustai, to talk about food. So bear with me for a second. There you go. For a lot of Americans, the best thing about Thanksgiving is the food. And no Thanksgiving meal is complete without, that's right, turkey. But why turkey exactly? How did this strange bird come to dominate the dinner table? Well, turkeys have a lot going for them. For one thing, they're big. Big enough to feed a family. For another, they're not usually raised for their eggs like chickens are. In the old days, that meant that turkeys were more... expendable, which in turn made turkey meat relatively cheap. The fact that wild turkeys are native to North America made them a natural choice to be served at early Thanksgiving celebrations, but that doesn't mean they were always the most important part of the feast. In fact, the event we now think of as the first Thanksgiving may not have had any turkey at all. It's true that the Pilgrims shared a meal with the Wampanoag Indians at Plymouth Colony in 1621. But all we know for sure about the menu is that it included deer and fowl. That fowl might have been turkey, but more likely it was ducks or geese. What's more, that 1621 meal didn't exactly start a trend. Throughout America's early history, some communities did hold ceremonies to give thanks for the fall harvest, and over time, the common turkey did become a popular centerpiece for these occasions. 
But the so-called First Thanksgiving was largely forgotten about until the 19th century when various local traditions inspired the idea of a national celebration. For more than 30 years, a writer named Sarah Josepha Hale advocated for Thanksgiving to become an official U.S. holiday. Her efforts finally succeeded in 1863 when Abraham Lincoln issued a presidential proclamation. Only then did people begin to think of Thanksgiving as a uniquely American observance. The story of the pilgrims became closely connected to the holiday, as did, well, the turkey. Even if they weren't served at the first Thanksgiving, turkeys were mentioned in pilgrims' journals. And at least one founding father was fond of them. Benjamin Franklin touted the turkey as a respectable bird and a true original native of America. By the end of the 19th century, people across the country were calling the holiday Turkey Day. Symbolism aside, it was practicality that ensured the turkey a permanent place on the Thanksgiving table. Through the years, they've remained affordable. They're big enough to feed a family with plenty of leftovers. A video from Britannica. So if you are listening to our podcast show, you do not have this advantage of the visual um, uh, pr uh, pleasure that we are taking on. But uh, if you go to uh, YouTube, Gold Tune, you'll see uh, this video. And also you'll see that I'm wearing apron. <laughs> and it is because I really wanted to get ready for our uh, today's discussion. I am so honored and privileged to have Omid Rustai with us. Hello, Omid. Hello, Sarah. So lovely to have been asked and to be here with you today. It's an absolutely an honor and pleasure. Okay, Omid is self-made, self-proclaimed professional chef, and, and he knows a great deal about meal, how to cook meal, how to prepare, and how to serve meals. So he has many um, cooking, show, cooking classes, he's been in many shows, and he knows a great deal about Persian cooking, cooking and also he's going to explain us um, a few dishes that it's his favorite or uh, two dishes he's preparing for this Thanksgiving and then two dishes that I asked if he could if he could share with us and um, before going to a, into a discussion I know that Omid Omid John you in your blog has a fantastic way of I mean it was so cozy so interesting the way you explain about you and uh, can you tell us what you've written in your blog uh, Persian uh, Persian chef no Caspian chef Omid Rustai Thank you. Thank you so much. So the quick story behind the blog is that I've been teaching Persian cooking classes for almost 20 years here in Seattle. And every time I teach a class, I was referring students to other blogs and resources for here are some other thoughts, here are some other places where you can get information. And one day I thought, isn't that strange? Why, why wouldn't I just have maybe my own blog? So I started writing the blog and and it, of course, you know, it starts very simple, it starts very slow, and you don't have much to say, you don't have your own voice yet. And as, as it progressed, I kind of found my own voice and the voice and the kind of my style around the blog is, listen, you can find the recipes anywhere. Like just put in your favorite Persian dish on, the, on Google or your search engine and you get a ton of uh, hits, but what makes what I thought what could make these more interesting as if they were what I call them living recipes, meaning if there's a personal story, if there's a narrative ties into the culture, to the ritual, to the traditions, and certainly for us Iranians living abroad, you know, we look back with our days in Iran with such a deep sense of nostalgia. And so I wanted to evoke and create that experience so that it isn't. Do you Just. have an example for us? Do you have an example of a dish and a story behind a dish? Uh, why? Which one? Uh, <laughs> yes, quite a few of them. Okay. So one that just right off the top of my head that popped into my head was lubia polo, mm -hmm. which is Persian uh, green beans and often with lamb or beef. That one I so deeply, deeply associated with one of my beloved uh aunts and and how she would prepare it and her secret what being her name ha uh, uh -huh. uh, my aunt ozar 
who unfortunately just recently passed away, um, she would make this dish. I think it was just the best I had ever had. And and the the memory around it is Rogan Kerman Shahi, this uh, solid, saturated, essentially lard, but from a sheep that she would use um, to, to flavor her meal. And I would always put a dollop of that on top of the rice and eat it with pickled vegetables and yogurt. So that to me, uh, it really captures, again, the essence of why this dish is so special because it evokes uh, such a deep memory of a long time ago. Absolutely. Omid, I forgot to mention that you're a psychotherapist. <laughs> And then what is the relationship between good food and and our psyche? Oh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every day we're discovering and learning so much about the connection between gut back, uh, uh, health and flora with our mental well-being and health. So um, what we eat does evoke a sense of calm, a sense of groundedness, and or a sense of stress and anxiety. So to me, the two are so interrelated. Uh, I first started as a microbiologist, then I transitioned into culinary school and worked as a private chef. And then I thought there was just more to do to bring health to people. And so I then progressed into grad school with psychotherapy, and now I do a blend of it all. Um, in in what I do. So, do you cook to get uh, to become or to to uh, analyze your patients, help <laughs> analyzing themselves better, or do you do the analytical work and psychoanalytical work, and then you think, oh my God, it's just too heavy. I need a good food to accompany that. Well, food to me is I, how I describe it as my source of self-care. Like after a long day of work and heavy work sometimes, I go right back into the kitchen to cook, not only to feed myself and my family, but also to take care of myself. So uh, sometimes working with clients, you know, the, the focus of the uh, conversation isn't necessarily about food, but if, hey, if somebody's struggling with depression or anxiety, I do ask, like, how are you taking care of yourself? You know, what sustain? What what are you? What's sustaining you? You mm -hmm. know, if you're surviving on a diet of sugar and carbohydrates, and you know, yes, we're going to talk about how so to. So let's say I am one of your patients, and I am <laughs> suffering from a deep depression. If you are so, going to suggest me something to eat in in order to just as a self care, what would you what would you recommend? I would say I would encourage you to incorporate a lot more vegetables and methods that are high action, like stir fry, that builds a lot of fire and builds a lot of energy into a meal. That is where I would start working with the client around how to bring more energetics into their diet and into their uh, well being. How about saffron? Oh, <laughs> well, I would say put saffron on anything and everything all the time, but that's what Iranians do. Certainly saffron has amazing, great qualities about it. Certainly it's been known and proven for supporting mental well-being and kind of being an uplifting agent. Um, so I don't necessarily go out of my way to incorporate saffron other than, listen, we're going to talk about a dish later. Like I, I definitely incorporate saffron not only because it has these great qualities but also the bright color is uplifting just the the appearance of it is very uplifting mm -hmm. i'm going to go to a nut loaf but before going there i'm going to tell you a quick story about saffron yes so i was nursing my daughter and my mom would make me kachi i don't know what is kachi in english so it's a halva it's like a, a thin and uh, halva uh, made thin so saffron brownie made thin yes. and then she put lots of saffron in it and i loved the dish i told my mom i have only one kid i told my mom that if it is if it, this is the deal that you are going to make me kachi every time that i am you know nursing and during this uh, during this period i get pregnant again yeah. <laughs> because i loved kachi, kachi. so much <laughs> yes loved it uh, but how, not love so you are going to do nut loaf and Brussels sprouts with caramel, caramelized onion. Tell yes. me about what you are making and where you are taking them. So 
every year is different, right? Every year, um, I think I look at the stages of my life when I worked as a personal chef, I my Thanksgiving was about working. So I catered Thanksgiving dinners. Now that I no longer do personal chef work, I sometimes host my own event and have friends come over. Or this year, we're actually guests at dear friends' home. And they've already designed a brilliant menu. And so they asked us to contribute a couple of vegetable dishes. So what I'm planning on bringing is Brussels sprouts that are just gently steeped first to soften them. You can use vegetable broth or chicken broth. Then I will caramelize some onions and then essentially get them to roast to get that nice golden crispy bits that we all love so much. Um, I may or may not incorporate some bacon in there and then just a really tender, lightly sweet sauce to go on top of it. So that's the Brussels sprout dish. Um, you can't be Persian and not contribute with a Persian dish. So I am also bringing a very uh, dear and flavorful dish to me, which is kadu, um, kashka kadu, which is butternut squash that is slowly cooked into a spread. Once again, topped with caramelized onion, the beloved Persian fried mint sauce and, and slivers of golden garlic and topped with what we call kashk, which is the Iranian uh, liquid whey uh, sauce. So these are the two main items that I'll be contributing to the event tonight. Yes. We do not or not cash, tonight, sorry, the, uh, the Thanksgiving. The, yes, yes. Night. Uh, so we do not, I, 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 I the, the closest, basically sauce, the closest ingredient, I mean, dressing I found to cash is, um, I forgot his name. Um, it's a, oh gosh, uh, it's a sour sour cream. Sour cream. Sour, yes, sure. a sour cream. But sour cream is not cashk. No. It's no. not cashk. <laughs> no. So you have to have the palate for cashk. It is not a light. <laughs> it's not a delicate thing. It's a hearty thing. So it may not certainly be everybody's cup of tea. Um, I taught a class last night, and we used cash for our Usher Joe. And I passed it around for people to taste. Half of the room really loved it. The other half, you know, made a made a frowning face because it is really strong. Essentially, it is a yogurt that is salted and cooked down till it turns into essentially a paste. That paste is then partially rehydrated and blended in a in a food processor or a blender, and so that you can maybe drizzle it out. So that's how kashk is made. It is umami it is salty it is the tangy of the yogurt it has a lot of flavor in there and some of us love it and maybe some folks maybe it's not it's a little too strong for them so in those cases i offer sour cream or yogurt just plain old yogurt is mm -hmm. is also quite delightful what happened why you got too excited or got into this direction of making food because I mean, I mean, you are a, you are a thin person, so to speak, for the people who are not seeing you. And then the assumption is okay. Most of the chefs eat whatever, <laughs> and then I'm I'm wondering. So what really? What what made what journey took yeah. you to the cooking? And how? I mean, do you eat all the food you you cook? Boy, um, so my journey was. I was working in cancer research field and wondering, is there a different way to respond, to correspond to, to cancer? And I thought of what would it be like to be on the preventative side of it? That is what ultimately motivated me to leave my biotech job and go to a plant-based improvisational intuitive cooking school. So I learned how to make healing food, so to speak. And, um, that's where the journey started. And so I worked with people that wanted to improve their health and, uh, and, and, and eat more vegetables, eat more whole food. So that is from biotech and cancer research, uh, found myself into cooking school. And again, I worked as a private chef and, and I love teaching. I have never taught it. When I first started, I had never taught a day in my life. They're like, oh, you're Persian and you're a chef. You should teach Persian classes. So they gave me a chef code and they put me in front of the classroom before I realized, oh my God, I have never taught a thing in my life. And I'm also afraid of public speaking. What the heck have I done to myself? Um, 
until you just you just find your 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 voice find your approach and i find found that i really thrive being in community with people teaching and learning and breaking bread to me teaching persian food is about you know removing some obstacles removing misunderstandings removing the barriers that gets in the way of our connection so i sat with 20 strangers yesterday last night from all paths of life who've never had persian food and they walked away having tasted kashk and having had kuku sabzi the fresh herb frittata and habich polo and the carrot rice so that's what really inspires me to carry on and keep doing what I have been doing. Hasn't ever the issue of nuclear program or <laughs> women who job or how many wives does your father have uh, really comes out in during the discussion? Um, nothing so bold and 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 challenging as what you what you just described. I think absolutely there are misunderstandings. Like I think. Uh, many foods are confused. Like uh, you know, they they assume we eat the same food as other parts of the the Middle East. So I'm uh, having to always kind of uh, differentiate what is Persian food, maybe what is Arabic food, what is Turkish food. While there are so many similarities, then there is the quintessential DNA of Persian food that is a little different than others. But nothing quite as severe as what you described. Fortunately, I've been really uh, blessed, I guess, that folks that come take my classes have some good basic understanding and maybe can differentiate what they may hear on the news and, and how they might view Iranians and, and Iran as a nation. Thank God. I'm Thank yes. God. Thank <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, I usually I mean, get these kind of questions. Um, so what is not love? Ah, uh, not love. So we are going to go to the details, Omid. We are going to go, okay, oh, you're yes. going to tell me how to make nut loaf. Oh, yes. So for almost a third of my life, I was a vegetarian. So a lot of my Thanksgivings have been uh, as a vegetarian. So it's about a centerpiece, right? I mean, turkey is the centerpiece of the dinner. So I would make a, a version of a nut loaf, and every year will be just a little different. But this year... Um, how I make the nut loaf is very simple. It is essentially cooked chestnuts, a range of nuts, could be pistachios, almonds, uh, pecans, whatever you like, you can toast them lightly. Uh, so essentially we get saute the onion uh, with whatever oil of choice. You would roast the chestnuts, you will roast the, um, the nuts themselves and you put them in a food processor and you pulse it so that they're just coarse chunks. And then you melt some cheese into that. Uh, I prefer a kind of a Wensleydale, if you can get it, uh, with a little bit of cranberries, some cheddar, and mix it all up together. You need some breadcrumbs to kind of bind it together. You put it in a loaf and you bake it. So it is as simple and as tasty and amazing as it sounds. And that often tends to be the centerpiece. You're saying loaf, so do you roll? So you put it in kind of like a casserole um, uh -huh. meatloaf uh, uh -huh. type of a, of a pan uh -huh. and cover it up with a piece of foil into the oven, 350 for you know, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how much you're making. And you then you let it cool, then you flip it out and you then of course want to put some garnish uh, pieces of cranberries, more nuts, leafy greens. What a, you know, this is this is where you can get really creative in how you present it. So that is uh, a nut loaf that I had several years ago, and I loved it. So this why, is my favorite. Why do you love it? Why do I love it? Because of the flavors, right? So this is the history about this this specific dish. Is uh, I met my in laws on Thanksgiving dinner, all of them, <laughs> literally. A whole lot of family uh, had arrived for Thanksgiving and I got to meet them. And so I made Persian food. Some of my British uh, in-laws uh, made um, various amazing British food. And my uh, one of my in-laws uh, brought this, made this nut loaf and I fell in love with it. So I actually reached out to her and asked her for the specific recipe that I'm planning on making.
Okay, excellent, excellent. You are planning to making and oh, okay. Do we have the um, um, permission to put the recipe of nut loaf on our website? Absolutely. This is by no means my creation. I think it is a creation of some amazing person on the internet that is just keeps on giving. I think the combination of nuts you choose, you personalize it. The kind of cheese you would use, you personalize it. So I'll be happy to uh, have that shared. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Tell me about your Instagram page. So uh, my Instagram page is the Caspian Chef. And uh, the reason I chose the Caspian Chef is because my parents are from the Caspian Sea region of Iran. And as a kid, I spent lots of amazing time up there. And so it is just the most endearing and special name that I could come up with. So my all my social media is under the Caspian Chef. All your social media is under Caspian Chef. Yes. And do we have a picture of, okay, chicken <laughs> stuffed with dried fruit uh, and saffron glaze? Yes. Um, so that is a very special dish to me. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll be teaching that dish in, in a couple of weeks uh, coming up. So it is you know, if you, this is exactly what we made for Thanksgiving last year because the events were much smaller and one chicken sufficed. So essentially you get a whole chicken, you do a good rub with a little salt and turmeric, and then you chop up some, I, I like tart apples. So I use Granny Smith apples with whatever fruits of choice you have on hand. You can use apricots, you can use plums, you can use raisins, whatever you like so that there's a nice balance of the tart and the sweet, and I'll throw in more uh, walnuts. I love walnuts, so I put in some bits, of, bits and pieces of walnut as the stuffing inside the chicken. And then a very simple uh, honey and lemon or lime juice and saffron that I dissolve and I brush that on top of the chicken and baste it as it cooks several times. So by the time it comes out, there's this highly aromatic, brightly colored and tender chicken that usually takes about less than 90 minutes depending on the size of the kitchen uh, chicken to cook mm -hmm. yes why do we celebrate uh being together uh, with food why food is almost almost always involved mm -hmm. in festivity and getting together it's so primal isn't it we all have to eat and we can all enjoy, we all enjoy good food. So it's really just combining the two pieces, the two primal pieces of humanity, the need for connection and the need for sustenance. And so when you look at all cultures and all traditions, there's always a ritual around coming together and sharing the abundance of, of the land, of the harvest and reasons to celebrate. Um, so. That's my idea, my thought as to why food is so special because it's so primal and the idea of sharing that abundance and joy is um, what I think is really important. Do you have a favorite Persian chef? Oh, <laughs> do I have, I mean, I'm going to say hands down our beloved Najmiya Batmangadij because she is, well, if you're familiar with Persian food and you know Najmiya. Persian she Julia is, Child. It, she really is. And New York Times just recently uh, acknowledged her as a, one of the most influential women putting uh, cuisine of Iran forward. So well-deserved. And so I have every so single have one ever... of her books. Yes, have you ever cooked any of her dishes, or which which one uh, do you have any favorite uh, in her in her uh, ah, cooking? I actually even think that the stuffed chicken that I just mentioned is from her uh, cook uh, her cookbook rather, and I've cooked so many. I mean, how long have I lived in the U.S.? I've been I've been essentially cooking the food that these wonderful people the pioneers put ahead for us um so absolutely all you know there is probably dozens of dishes that i have um 
learned to cook from Najmi's cookbook until I finally found kind of my own voice and my own techniques and my own choice of seasoning that, that I have personalized it to my taste. What would be the major difference between your stuffed, uh, your, uh, stuffed ch chicken and Najmi, as you think? Oh, that's a good question. I have to think of what she had put on her recipe that I don't off the top of my head remember, but I just, I think, I, I am playful with uh, the choice of uh, dried fruits that I might put in there. I may change the nuts. Um, I may put more onions inside of it. So I think it's just, it's subtlety of what you stuff the fish, or rather in this case, the chicken with. Um, so mm -hmm. changing of the fruits, I think is is the essentially the, the main change that I would that would incorporate into my chicken. Let's say that you and Najmi are in the same room and doing a competition. <laughs> oh no, oh, oh no. <laughs> no. Who knows, maybe you win. I, I, I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't imagine <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so if we're in a room putting, cooking together, what would I, what would I do differently? No, no, I'm or? thinking maybe oh. if, if you were together and then you were cooking. So there there might be a possibility that you win. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm going to be very honest and respectful and say, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I accept your honesty and humbleness. <laughs> very good. Stay put with me. You are watching Peace Mindedly, a podcast show featuring peaceful bridge makers. For this hour, we are talking with Omid uh, Rustai, um, um, writer for his famous blog, uh, Caspian Chef Omid Rustai. He has plenty cook classes i'm going to ask him where to find some of them are i think many of them are online and then you can find his blog just google search omid rustai and you'll find him and also and also his instagram page has plenty information about persian cuisine and and persian cooking there are a few may this style i mean in persian cooking is under the umbrella of arab cooking and Middle Eastern cooking. So they're under uh, Mediterranean cooking. In this cooking, we usually use lots of vegetables and everything is built from scratch, from absolute scratch. It's, I mean, oftentimes if you're a serious cook, we do not use canned vegetables. We do not use canned beans. It's uh, all of them are get prepared and get included into a dish uh, in a very authentic way. Um, but uh, um, and the style is uh, the same, so to speak. The technique is the same. So it's usually involved um, uh, olive oil or uh, canola oil or any of those oils uh, includes um, onion and then uh, many of the bits and vices compared to French uh, cooking, which usually involves cheese and butter or compared to Mexican cuisine usually involves beans and uh, and rice so this is usually involved onion and vegetables and meat is also a part of that um it's a thanksgiving weekend and everyone is talking about turkey everyone is talking about food i'm in my apron ready to to explain what's thanksgiving and i'm super honored and excited for today's show i'm gonna ask uh, omid about um um, his experience of um so no first I, I would like to know where to find his oh i i'm here where to find his cooking classes and the second um has have you ever made any arab food or any food other than persian cuisine that you like first about your cooking classes absolutely so i do a good job and keeping my cooking class listings up to date. So if you go to my blog at thecaspianchef.com, there's a tab called uh, cooking classes. So all my classes are listed there. Um, certainly initially it was all in person and as pandemic hit us and I we all had to pivot and we, most of us switched to or had to switch to online version of our classes. And what we're noticing is 
the online demands are declining and disappearing because people are really truly hungry and gathering around the table. So at this point, my classes are, uh, majority of my classes are in person where I teach locally here in Seattle. You didn't answer my question about whether or not you eat all the food you make. Absolutely. I think uh, one thing I always joke about and tell friends is like they see the pictures that I post on Instagram and they are like, oh, what time is dinner? We're coming over. And the joke is, listen, the pictures look really amazing and pretty for the photograph. By the time we get to eat it, it's cold, it's congealed, <laughs> it's less than less than exciting. So is it one of the reasons that you don't, you are not too fat because it's... <laughs> <laughs> the food no longer looks like what you see on the picture. Yes. I mean, I'm not a... I'm not a trained professional uh, photographer. I've taught myself how to take pictures. So it takes me a while. I have the patience. It takes me a while to take pictures and then I'll edit them and I post them. But by the time I've taken the pictures, uh, an hour has gone by. That dish is <laughs> sat I under know. a you know, photo lighting. And honey, dinner's ready. It won't look like anything you'll see two days from now on Instagram. Yes. But yes. Uh, that's how we eat. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, other uh, cuisines, uh, yes, I love I love all cuisines. I really, I wouldn't say I am the most adventurous eater, particularly when it comes to animal food. Uh, again, given that I was a vegetarian for a long time, I'm very conservative with with the choice of animals that I do eat. But when it comes to vegetables and seasoning and grains and noodles. I love them all. I, I love Japanese food. I love Mexican food. I adore Thai food. So name it, one Japanese food that you really enjoy oh, other than sushi. Ramen. Uh -huh. Hands down ramen. Uh, I mean, there's just so it's like a hug in a bowl. <laughs> it's, it's this beautiful broth, very intentionally and mindfully pre prepared broth with the noodles, which is the carb we all, a lot of us love, I love, and the boiled egg, softly boiled eggs, and the choice of protein, whatever it may be, and just the, the toppings, it really just makes it such a diverse and fascinating and interesting texture of, of ingredients in one bowl. So I love ramen. I could do truly have, eat that. Do you have a ramen dish on your website? Uh, I don't. I as I started the blog, I really, I really just dedicated it to to Persian cuisine, partially because I just felt like it, we were underrepresented. Uh, there weren't that many blogs out there. Well, there's plenty, um, but I just wanted to throw in my voice into the hat. So I tried to keep it essentially pure in and I think there is about one or two dishes that I, as we say in Farsi, man daravardi, daravardi. I, I made it up myself. Improvising, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I just kind of used Persian ingredients, but there is no such a dish, right? Because I, I was like just what? in the mood. There is a cake. There is a cake that <laughs> I, of the hundred, whatever, 30 posts that I have there, this humble little vegan cake. I mean, what I just... What is the name? I think it is... A, cake, a vegan cake all um, made with pears mm -hmm. and saffron and I think orange blossom as a flavoring. I, as I write, that was one of my one of my most endearing posts to this day. Because I go into the kitchen, I describe how I drifted in the kitchen longing for something. I wasn't sure what it was that I wanted. So I'm like, I'll make a cookie. No, I don't want a cookie. I'll make a scone. No, I don't want scones either. What do I, and it just, I was looking for home. I was truly longing for something that just reminded me of who I am, where I come from, and some of the familiar flavors and taste. And part of the reason it was vegan is because I actually never learned how to bake regular baking. I learned to bake as a vegan. And so, I know intuitively how to put a cake together, but I would have to look up a recipe how to make a cake with eggs and butter. So 
part of cooking a vegan was also returning home to a part of myself that really appreciates plant food mm -hmm. and simplicity of, of food through that lens. So that is my all time favorite and um, uh, most cherished post of mine yes, for myself. Yes, cake, the, that we, uh, we are going to find where that is and uh, post it on the on Gold Tune. What is the closest um, um, uh, soup or dish in uh, Persian cuisine to ramen? Oh, well, <laughs> mm -hmm. well I mean, it, it's not comparable, but it is has the elements of it, right? There is the the depth of flavor for folks that are not familiar ash is the word we use for a kind of a thicker stew thicker soup uh, style of food in persian food and rishte is noodles so it is a, 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 a heavy soup with variety of beans and um, noodles and a ton of fresh herbs which is just such a classic and signature of Persian food. Then again, topped with a fried mint and garlic sauce, topped with that whey cash that we had talked about earlier. So that to me is um, the closest, I think I, I, it's a bit of a stretch here, but that's the closest I can come up with to a delicious brothy uh, ramen. Excellent. Um, so before we go to another quick break, I'm thinking, what is your advice for us uh, for the Thanksgiving? Because I know that we eat uh, plenty. So as someone who pays attention to food, what should we consider during the, during the Thanksgiving table and during the eating? Advice from what perspective? For, let's say, for instance, um, uh, would you would you recommend eating any herbs after uh, ah. done with a dish, or how to paste ourselves during the meal, or um, so, or how how would you paste yourself during the meal for the Thanksgiving? Yeah, I think what do you we do? we have such an association with overstuffing forgive me like we we tend to eat a lot for thanksgiving and I, and it's easy to do because there's so many servings there's so many side dishes so it, by the time you even get a bite of this a spoon of this you have a plate completely full of food so i actually like to kind of my advice is you don't have to take every little bite of everything um pick your favorites and make sure that you, obviously there's gonna be dessert involved, so make sure that you're not already full, leaving to the dessert. Um, eating slower is a brilliant way to manage the satiety signals that we receive in our brain. Often we're eating a little too fast. So if you just slow it down, enjoy the bites, check in, chat with your, with your guests or with your host, and really just slow it down so that you're not um, quickly eating too much food before your brain receives the signal that you've already been full. Uh, herbs, I think, are just a beautiful um, gastronomic experience, whether you eat it pre, uh, before you start the meal, you know, Iranian style, where we have a little bread, a little feta, and a ton of fresh herbs. I think it just is a good appetite opener. And it really helps with the cleansing at the end, just kind of cleanse the palate before you transition to the next dish. So slow down and, and involve and engage with more conversations. Yes, yes. Very good advice. So uh, people who are watching our show know that I'm making lots of mistakes during the show I mean, in terms of writing because I don't have my system producer. So I'm all by myself today in this beautiful Sunday day. Please stay put with me. You are watching to Peace Mindedly, a podcast featuring peaceful bridge makers. Omid is one of the uh, peaceful bridge makers who are bridging Iran and US. Um, you know, that Iran and US are not in good terms in terms of uh, politics and and the social uh, interactions. They are not. And I believe we need people like Omid who are bridging gaps and telling stories a political stories about people and there is no no better way than uh, talking or telling stories about food and about culture it's the 
signature for our show, asking our, fr uh, our guests to share something meaningful about the peace, about kindness and compassion. And I would like to know what Omid has for us, anything about peace, kindness, uh, compassion that you think you would like to share with us. Absolutely. Of course, when, when preparing for this, I reached for uh, automatically reach for either Hafez or Rumi. So the quote that I found, that the poem, the small, uh, very short poem that I found that I really love, I will read for you. And that is, be grateful for your life, every detail of it, and your face will come to shine like a sun. And everyone who sees it will be made glad and peaceful. Persist in gratitude and you will slowly become one with the sun of love, and love will shine through you. It's all healing joy. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Omid. It's been a pleasure hosting you and having you on Peace Mindedly with my apron and a happy <laughs> thank. I mean, Thanksgiving that is on the way. I uh, really appreciate it. This show is going to be posted on the, no, it's going to be posted on Wednesday. So a day before Thanksgiving. And thank you so much uh, and uh, God bless. Thank you so much, Sarah, for thinking of me and inviting me. It was truly a joy being here today with you. The same here. Khoda Hafez. Khoda Hafez.